Hey Mosaic family, I am Cyril Chavis. I'm the RUF campus minister at Howard University and I am really excited to be with you all virtually this Lord's Day. Um, so if you all would turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12, we'll just go on and dive right in. Genesis chapter 12. Uh, so I wanna look at Abram and Sarai's story and really get the truth from the story that God will fulfill his promises no matter what. God will fulfill his promises no matter what. So again, turn with me to Genesis chapter 12. We are going to start reading at verse 1. I am in the ESV, the English Standard Version. All right. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you and I will excuse me, I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you. I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran and Abram took Sarai, his wife and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Now, there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a beautiful woman in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him. And they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. This is the word of the Lord. Would you all pray with me? Lord, thank you for this time where we can dig in your word. Lord, we acknowledge that when we read your word and explain your word, that you speak. And when you speak, we are comforted, we are challenged, we are transformed, uh, we are built up in every way. And so, God, I pray that you would do that in this moment now. Amen. All right, so I want to start our time off with a question. Um, have you ever been in a situation in life or maybe a period of time in life where you have known someone who has had your back no matter what? Have you known someone who has had your back no matter what? Now, I remember in elementary school and middle school, I was a skinny and weak kid. I still am skinny and weak. But I remember I had a best friend named Matt. And Matt was a big dude. He was built like a linebacker. And that's why it didn't matter that I was skinny and weak. So I remember one time I was going to the bathroom. You remember in class when we had class breaks, you know, we were all going to the bathroom and I was the one in there first. And someone came in behind me and we were just chatting. And Matt was the third one in. I remember Matt 
came up and squared up with the guy and said, hey, Cyril, is this dude bothering you? And I remember I was kind of surprised. I said, whoa, no, Matt, you know, we're, we're just chatting. It's cool. And Matt was like, okay. And so, you know, Matt was in a situation where he was willing to confront this guy because he thought uh, this guy was bothering me or challenging me. The point was that Matt had my back in a crisis, whether this crisis was real or imaginary. And family, I'm here to tell you today um, that you have someone who has your back no matter what in a crisis. Uh, and family, we are experiencing a crisis at this moment in 2020. We're facing a global pandemic. We are facing unrest in our cities. We, we see in the news people dying and um, um, police brutality and just unrest over racial issues. And we are deeply aware of the fact that we are in a crisis. And then in the midst of a crisis, we can feel uh, frustrated, lonely, depressed, anxious, fearful. And all of these things can make us feel defeated and can cause us to potentially run away from God. But I am here, Mosaic, to tell you that God will fulfill his promises to his people no matter what. And I want to persuade this, uh, persuade you of this through Abram's life. So the first thing, God will fulfill his promises to you in an economic meltdown. God will fulfill his promises to you in an economic meltdown. So in the text, Abram was living in Mesopotamia with his father and his brothers and his brother's families. And they were generally relying on each other um, for support and help. They had each other's backs. And then here comes this new God who appears to Abram and says, hey, basically God says, um, Abram, pack up all your things, leave your father's house, start walking and stop when I tell you to stop. <laughs> so uh, Abram starts traveling. He travels more than a thousand miles and then on the way, um, either through death or through just leaving them behind, uh, is just him, his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot. And they end up in Canaan. And so they settle down there. So they are in a scary situation. They are in a foreign land and have left all of their support system behind. Um, but on their journey, on the way, God gave them beautiful promises. God told them, he says in verse two, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And then on top of that, when they got to their destination, God gave them another promise. He said to them, to your offspring, I will give this land. So here you have 75 year old Abram with his barren wife, uh, Sarai, and they get these huge promises that they will have offspring, which seems impossible, and that they will have this land, which also seems impossible because they are strangers. Um, but they stay and believe these promises and they stay in this very scary situation because of this new God um, with a handful of literally unbelievable promises. And then guess what happens next? There is a famine. Now, a famine is basically a word that um, denotes an extreme shortage of food. They get to this new land, with this new God and these unbelievable promises. And the next thing that happens is that there is a famine. There is basically an economic meltdown. Um, they were in a crisis. And so family, maybe you, you can relate just as Abram is and Sarai and Lot are facing this large scale crisis and God's promise look distant. Maybe in our crisis in 2020, uh, we are despairing and it can make God's promises look very distant. Uh, COVID and all the unrest, maybe it's caused crisis in your social life. Um, I know we're all craving social interaction and for things to go back to normal. And maybe you can't go to that coffee shop that you love to go to. Maybe you can't meet with the same group and the same organizations you used to meet with. Maybe you're a part of, of, of a, a college and really just the college experience is being kind of rained upon right now. Uh, there might be all different kind of ways where the crisis that we're experiencing right now is, is, is causing distress in your social life. But maybe um, for those of you who are on your jobs or at school, maybe it's causing distress 
in your jobs or your coursework. Maybe you're in graduate school or working towards a PhD or maybe working towards getting your associate's or bachelor's degree and you're not sure if you're really gonna graduate or if you can really do your coursework. Now, maybe you're in a job and you're looking for that next promotion or you were looking to meet all these different goals financially and um, maybe in the community or maybe you're running a nonprofit and you feel like everything has come to a halt or maybe you're just now recovering from um, all, all of the things that, that the, the crisis is disrupting. Um, but even in the midst of all of this, God will fulfill your promises in an economic meltdown. Maybe even personally, you're, you're wondering about your finances and you're wondering how you're gonna provide for yourself. You're, you're wondering about the economy and is there a, a, a real future economically for you? But God will fulfill his promises in an economic meltdown. But not only in an economic meltdown, God will fulfill his promises in a violent society. So um, Abram and Sarai and Lot moved to Canaan and there's a famine. And so they travel, they already traveled about a thousand miles from Mesopotamia to Canaan. And now they're traveling about 800 more miles to Africa to go to Egypt. Now, Egypt was a common place where people went during wars or famine to get food or to get jobs and employment. Um, and Abram is scared for his life when he gets to Egypt. Why is this? Because his wife was gorgeous and he is afraid that he will be murdered so that someone can take his wife as their own. And later on in chapter 20, we find out that Abram has this fear because he realizes that the lands that he is traveling through, they do not have a fear of God. These lands, as a result of their lack of a fear of God, they are violent. Violence is a part of the culture and it's a part of the atmosphere of these places. Um, um, even in the, in, the, in, in, in the leadership, in the, in the powers, the people in power, uh, they contribute to this violent culture. There is a culture of violence in Egypt. And maybe we can relate in the United States that as we read the news and as we look around us, as we look at our cities, as we look at our neighborhoods, we realize that there is violence all around us. As we read history, our own history as a country, um, and maybe our own history as a state and as a city, we realize that there is pathological violence all throughout our history. And even the whole, the history of all of humankind, violence in, is everywhere. And even um, violent in, in, in every type of way, uh, sexual violence, violent uh, racism, uh, violence uh, just w w through crime and violence in, 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 in the domestic fear. There is violence in every type of way. And maybe this violence is causing a crisis for you. Uh, maybe it has caused a crisis in your quality of life. Maybe during this time, your mental and emotional health have taken a huge hit. Um, we, we live in an age where you can accidentally watch someone die on your phone, on social media. Uh, we, we live in a time where violence is all around us and it's before our eyes at every turn. Uh, maybe you're wondering how you can keep it together with your anxiety and your fear. Maybe in your future plans, you, you're wondering, man, like my, my, my plans to, to have this job or my future aspirations, like what does it mean to live in a place that is violent, uh, where, where, where we feel our lives are at risk at all times? And maybe if you are a minority, maybe you're African-American, uh, you are particularly anxious during this time and racial unrest, you're really wondering what place uh, in, in America does a black person truly have? And maybe for... Maybe you aren't a minority. Maybe maybe you're a white person and, and, and you are looking at all the things that are happening around you and you are wondering and despairing, how can I enter into all of this violence as a Christian and truly make a difference? Uh, and maybe in your in your hometown, you see violence all around you and you are feeling overwhelmed at how you can actually change things. And as Christians, we are called to enter into a violent society with peace and shalom, with a message of peace and actions of peace. But a, a, a violent society makes us feel overwhelmed and we feel the crisis. But family, God will fulfill his promises to you in a violent society. But not only that, God will fulfill his promises to you in your shortcomings. So we see that Abram is in this crisis. He's in Egypt. He is scared for his life because he's scared that people are going to kill his, um, kill him and take his wife. 
So what does he do? He comes up with a deceitful plan. So he, he, he talks to his wife and basically says, hey, don't tell them you are my wife. Tell them you're my sister. And, and we're technically Sarai is his half sister, but we won't get into that. But basically, um, Abram wants to avoid uh, the, 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 the potential of violence. And he wants to give away his wife in order to do that. Uh, so here we have Abram giving away the means by which God will bless him. You remember God told him, I will give you offspring. I will make you into a mighty nation. And God wants to do this through barren Sarai. And what does Abram do? He gives her away. Um, and so as a result of this, Abram benefits from the culture of violence in Egypt because Abram was now going to become uh, Pharaoh's future brother-in-law. Uh, the, the, the text tells us that Abram gained riches and he gained servants and he gains livestock. Abram is benefiting from this culture of violence. And though we can have sympathy for Abram, I know I've never been in a situation like that, so I can have some sympathy for him. We see that instead of operating out of faith, he was operating out of fear. Uh, he was operating out of fear instead of faith. God had already told him, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. God had Abraham, Abram's back no matter what. But Abram could not see past the opportunity to spare his life from the famine and his life from, this, from, the, from the injustice and the culture of violence that was all around him. Abram's faith was weak. And maybe you can relate. Perhaps some of us have failed to trust in God's provision in the face of a global pandemic and the culture of violence that is all around us. And perhaps this lack of trust in God has led us to respond in sinful ways to others and to ourselves and to God himself. Um, but there's comfort in this passage. God will fulfill his promises not only in an economic meltdown in a violent society, and in our shortcomings, but God will fulfill his promises in a glorious way. God will fulfill his promises in a glorious way. So check it out. Abram has just given away his wife. She um, the, basically Pharaoh's princess see her, take her and are bringing her to Pharaoh. And back in that day, when you were going to become Pharaoh's wife or concubine, there was a, a, a period of preparation where they basically kind of got you ready to consummate the marriage with Pharaoh. And so while uh, uh, Sarai is being prepared to become Pharaoh's wife, God starts jacking up Pharaoh's household. Uh, basically, God steps into the situ situation as like, Abram, you are not going to mess up my plan to bless you with offspring through Sarai. Uh, God basically says, I told you you were going to be a great nation, and that is what is going to happen. So like I said, while, while Sarai is being prepared to be Pharaoh's wife, God steps in the situation and brings um, plagues and afflictions to Pharaoh's house, all because Pharaoh messed with the wrong people. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be Abram? I mean, you have just given away your wife and, and now you're rich and you're probably feeling really guilty. You're like, dang, I just gave away my wife and like I kind of quit on God's promises because I gave away the means by which God would bless me. But little did he know behind the scenes that God was working on his behalf. Uh, if only he knew what was happening behind the scenes, he would rejoice. God was jacking up Pharaoh's whole, ho whole house and Abram didn't even know it. Um, and then Pharaoh summons Abram and he's basically like, Abram, why didn't you tell me she was your wife? <laughs> he's like, take her and get out of my kingdom. And Pharaoh's people make sure that Abram and Sarai leave Egypt. Uh, and so, family, I'm here to tell you tonight, uh, or, or I'm sorry, I'm here to tell you this morning that when you belong to God, absolutely nothing will prevent him from being faithful to you. Nothing will prevent him from fulfilling his promises to you, not in a global uh, 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 economic meltdown, not in a pandemic, not in a violent society, not even your own sin can prevent God from fulfilling his promises to you. And if only you can see what God is doing behind the scenes, Mosaic, you would celebrate. God is a friend who will fight for you at the drop of a dime. God is that parent who will bail you out of your troubled situation. 
God is determined to bless you in your mess, Christian. And not only will God fulfill his promises to you, Mosaic, in the midst of a crisis, he will even use the crisis to fulfill his promises. So remember, the text tells us that Abram and Sarai left Egypt with riches and wealth. All of these things that God had promised from the get-go to give them. So it looks like God even used the sin and in, 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 in the, in the crazy situation itself to fulfill the promises to Abram and Sarai in a mysterious way. And this happens because God is big enough to use our sin and our suffering for his own glory. I think this is a perfect picture of what Romans 8.28 talks about when it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Literally all things work together for good. Uh, family, all bad things will work for your good. Nothing truly good can ever be taken away from you. And the best is yet to come, no matter what it looks like. Uh, Mosaic, I don't know exactly what it looks like for you in, in Waco during this time, but I want you to believe with all of your heart that God is for you in the midst of a crisis, Christian. And because of that, you are able to continue to trust in God as you push towards your goals in this life. And so I, I have a little homework. Your homework is to create two lists. One list is, are, is, is all of the things that are happening in, in, in a crisis, all the things that are scaring you, all of the things that are causing you to despair. And on the other list, I want you to write down God's promises from his word. And I want you to remind yourself, however often you need to, that these two lists don't cancel each other out, that both of these two things are true. A crisis can be true, but God's promises are also true. He will fulfill them to you. Um, now, some of you are thinking this is way too good to be true. Um, I can't believe that God would do something like this for Abram. Um, because the reality is, um, in the situation with Pharaoh, Abram was really kind of the only one who sinned. Um, like, Ab Pharaoh didn't know that this was Abram's wife. <laughs> uh, and Abram was the one who came up with the deceitful plan and convinced his wife to come up to be a part of this plan. Uh, really, Abram deserved to be cursed instead of blessed. Abram sinned. And the only difference between Pharaoh and Abram in this situation is that Abram belonged to God and Pharaoh did not. And you may be thinking the same thing. You, you may be thinking, man, during this, this time and during crises and, and difficult times, I have doubted God and I have, uh, have so many sins and shortcomings and mistakes I've made. There is no way that I deserve to be blessed by God. There is no way that God is still with me in the midst of my crisis. Now, Mosaic, I'm here to tell you that God sees our sins and our shortcomings in the midst of our crises, but he is determined to bless us. He is so determined to bless us that he sent his only begotten son to the world to become a human. And as a human, Jesus deserved no cursing in his crisis because he lived his life perfectly. But Jesus received cursing in his crisis so that we can receive blessings in ours. He took the curse of God on our behalf so that there is no more curses for us. You see, Jesus is the true and better Abram. Abram avoided danger so that he can gain riches for himself. But Jesus moved into danger on the cross so that he can gain spiritual riches for you. Abram gave away his bride to spare his own life. But Jesus gave away his own life to spare his bride, the church. Uh, the cross is the reason why God blesses undeserving sinners in the midst of their crises. And not only that, but Jesus is the true and better Sarai. Sarai sinfully gave herself away in order to spare her husband's life in a crisis. But Jesus beautifully gave himself away to spare his own life in a crisis. And Jesus rose again, overcoming death and violence and suffering so that he might walk with you in your valley of the shadow of death as your king and as your Lord over all things. Family, God will fulfill his promises to you in an economic crisis. God will fulfill his promises to you in a violent society. God will fulfill his promises to you in 
your shortcomings, and God will fulfill his promises to you in a glorious way. And you can be sure of this because of the work of Jesus on your behalf. The question is, will you trust him? Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for um, the fact that Abram and Sarai uh, faced a scary situation, but they faced it with you. And as a result, God, you are watching over them, protecting them, uh, intervening on their behalf. So God, I ask that you would do the same for us in the midst of our suffering and our trials and our crises. God, I pray that you remind us that those who trust in Jesus, that all things work together for our good. And that God, you are with us, working on our behalf. Uh, even in the midst of our sin, even in the midst of our despairing, even in, this, in the midst of our fear, we can trust in you and rely on you because of who you are, God, and your greatness and your wisdom and your power and your goodness. Lord, we love you. Amen.